Our gospel lesson comes from the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. We're looking at verses 44 through 52, reading in Christ's name. Uh, Jesus is speaking. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of the house who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. So many of you guys know that we're moving Connie out here. And as we were doing that, you got to pack up and, and load things into a truck. And we, we kind of took that opportunity to kind of purge. It was a good time to say, hey, we don't need this and we don't need that. But it started to, to really cause me to think, especially about our text today. And I started thinking about the question, how do we value things? What's the process that we go through to place a high value on specific things in our life? There were certain aspects of memorabilia from all four of our kids that there was no way that we were going to throw away. They were just too valuable to us because they meant so much to us. But as we value things in life, how do we do that? How do we place value on things? And as I was thinking about that, and I've said this many times already, and I know my confirmation students have this question and answer drilled into their head. And you will hear this question from me continually uh, for as long as God calls me here or, or until you finally just throw me out and get rid of me. The question is this, what is the most valuable thing that you can possess in this life? And the answer is salvation. The most valuable treasure that we possess in this life is indeed the salvation that Christ Jesus has provided through his life, death, and resurrection. It is that treasure in the middle of a field. It is that pearl of great price. For that gift of salvation yields the great promise and inheritance of eternal life. And Paul remind, reminds us of the greatness of that promise. That no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor mind of man imagined what God has in store for those who love him. This is the most valuable thing that we can possess. And I pray that as we walk through this text God would do a miracle in our hearts and a work in our hearts to maybe, I don't know, maybe not so much birth that love and passion, but to cultivate and maybe stoke that fire, that passion to pursue God, to have a genuine, authentic relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because of all that he has done to place the highest value on the greatest gift the universe has ever seen. Lord, I thank you for this text and this great reminder of the awesome treasure that we do possess with salvation in you. Lord, I pray that every word that proceeds from my mouth would be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name and all of God's people said. And so the very first thing that we see in our text, and I've already kind of given this away, that salvation in Christ is the greatest treasure. Salvation in Christ is the greatest treasure. Jesus begins, he's speaking privately to his disciples. Uh, they had asked him several questions about previous parables, and as he was answering those questions, he continues, and he, he lets them know these two parables to kind of point to a couple different things. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered it up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field. So let's just say you're a farmer and there's a piece of land that you wanted to buy and you ask the person who owned that land, hey, can I go walk the field? So he walks out there and he finds this great treasure. 
Now, the man doesn't tell the, the owner about it, and, and the deception isn't part of the parable. It's the treasure that was found. But it's also the radical nature of what each person does in these, in these two parables. He sells all that he has to buy this field. That radical type of behavior is to remind us of the radical love that we have in Christ Jesus. If you think about John 3, 16, and as you think about that verse, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Again, can you imagine that verse without the word so in it? God so loved the world. As sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve and the deception in the Garden of Eden, humanity was infected with a sin nature. All of creation now groans as we actually read last week in our epistle lesson as it says earlier in Romans chapter eight, all of creation groans to be restored and we too groan. And I'm gonna tell you, the day after we unloaded that truck, I was groaning a little bit. My, my back was feeling it. But as we think about all of those things, how do we place value on salvation in Christ Jesus? Is this something we kind of participate in once in a while? Is this something that we kind of think about once a week? Is it something that is on our mind on a continual basis? As best I can, I try to cultivate this environment where I'm reading scripture every morning, I'm praying every morning, and sometimes I'll even pray all throughout the day. My kids would ask me, like, who are you talking to? And I'm like, well, I'm talking to God. But this is the pearl of great price. This is the greatest treasure that we can possess and again, that radical nature that we would sell all that we have, it kind of mirrors what Jesus said, that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and strength. As sin entered into the world, did God have to provide salvation? In a sense, we have to kind of say, well, no, but also yes. No, from the standpoint that he wasn't obligated at all because we brought it on ourselves. But yes, in the sense of his character, and as I said in our old treasure, our Old Testament lesson, that he views humanity as his treasured possession. That Hebrew word segula means something so much more than the English language can talk about. It's the apple of his eye, his treasured possession, his favorite son or daughter, his, the esteem and the proud nature that he feels toward the, the sense of humanity. And as we were going through that memorabilia, Connie and I, we had, you know, we had baby pictures. We had their first lock of hair. We had you know, the first card that they made us with crayons that you could barely read. But we loved those things. We had their, their cap from their graduation ceremony. And you think about all those things, and they were, they were treasures to us. But to anyone else, it would be just something that you would just want to throw away. But the way that God treasures you, because God so loved the world, that each and every one of you are so precious to him that he was unwilling to leave you without the, hope, without the hope of salvation because God's greatest desire is to spend eternity with each person here. That's why God so loved the world. But this type of love doesn't come naturally to us. It flows naturally out of the Lord. Because of that sinful nature, it's kind of contrary to us. We're kind of by nature selfish, kind of by nature lazy, kind of by nature, not really wanting the things of God. And so as new creations in Christ Jesus, as we are baptized into Christ, as we continue in faith, as we maybe are converted at a later life or God worked a revival like he did in my heart, whenever that happens, we become this new creation in Christ Jesus. And in that new creation status, as we are taken out of the kingdom of darkness and placed into the kingdom of light because of Christ's salvation, God has given us his Holy Spirit and we need to do all that we can to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate an environment for an authentic, radical type of faith in Christ that mirrors the radical love that God loves us with. This willingness to give all that we have for the sake of the kingdom, to give all, that we, who, all of who we are over to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because the one thing I said before, and I will continue to say again, yes, salvation is free. But the one thing that God asks of us in the wonderful free gift of salvation, that is the greatest treasure, all he wants from us is our heart. But he wants all of it, not just parts of it. The next thing that we say, see in our text 
is that salvation is for all, but unfortunately, many will reject it. Salvation is for all people, but unfortunately, many will reject it. Let's look at verses 47 through 50. Again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers and threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so in love, as Jesus speaks directly to these disciples, as 11 of those disciples will become apostles of the believing church, he speaks to them honestly, truthfully, and in love. He speaks to truth and love, not only for their benefit, but also for ours. And so the kingdom of heaven is for all, and all throughout the Old Testament, we are reminded of that, that the coastlands wait for God's justice, that as the Messiah was called to and through the nation of Israel, and that salvation would begin again in Jerusalem and then go out to all of the world. After Christ had risen from the dead and he gives that great commission, go to all the world. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, be baptizing, making disciples of all people and teaching them all that I have commanded you. And so the promise of salvation, yes, was to and through the nation of Israel, but it's always been for the entire world. And to that I say hallelujah and amen. And so God offers salvation to any and all who will call on the name of the Lord because scripture says everyone, not just some, says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. But he also tells us the truth. And you think about doctors, you know, I don't go to a doctor and pay that doctor to lie to me. I wouldn't want that doctor to tell me a half truth or, or part of the truth or not tell me the truth. And so Jesus in love tells the truth for the sake of our own souls. So it will be at the end of the age that the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. And of course, the only way that we can become righteous is in Christ. We are clothed in Christ's righteousness and we are placed into a right standing with God because of Christ's righteousness and we remain in our right relationship with God again because of Christ's righteousness. It's been credited to us. Galatians chapter three, verse 27, talks about how we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so those who are righteous because of Christ, those who are saved, those who are new creations, this will be a glorious day, a day like no other, a day where we will actually get the inheritance that has been promised and guaranteed through the power of the Holy Spirit, an inheritance that is beyond our wildest imagination, an inheritance that gives us hope in the midst of difficulties, it gives us peace in the midst of turmoil. And it even gives us comfort in the midst of grief and distress. The promise of eternal life reminds us that this world is not our home. And that in Christ Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, he has offered this incredible gift, this treasure, this pearl of great price, the most valuable thing that we can possess. And so salvation is for all. But as I said, unfortunately, many will reject it. The final thing that we see in our text is that disciples of Christ are called to be continual learners. Disciples of Christ are called to be continual learners. So this kind of says the same thing twice because the word disciples in the Greek literally means learner. And a lot of times in a grammatical sense, it's in a present active, meaning it's continual It's something that continues on throughout the entirety of our life. I think it, it's one of the most of the exciting things about my calling as a pastor. You know, I was an audio engineer before I, I, I had this call that God gave to become a pastor and a preacher of the gospel of Christ. And the one thing I absolutely love about my calling is that there's no glass ceiling to scripture, meaning I'll never know all there is about scripture. And that may sound kind of weird, but that excites me. Because there's always more to learn, always more to read. And every time I read a text, even though I've preached on it before, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit will kind of give me like a new nugget, a new treasure that I find in Scripture. And that excites me. I love that. I know many of you guys know this, but Tuesday is my study day, and I love Tuesdays. Not because I don't want to talk to people or whatever, but it's my time to get my coffee and get my books open and just really dig into God's Word. And I love that day. And I'm telling you, it flies by. 
I'll start at like 8.30 or 9 in the morning and I look at the clock, it's like 2. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even eat yet. And I love that part of it. I do. And so what Jesus is trying to express to the disciples is, is to have that passion. Have that passion for the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he asked them, and I think this is kind of a funny question. So he looks at the disciples and says, have you understood all these things? And their answer was, well, yes. Well, that's not totally true because all we need to do is go to Acts chapter one and they ask Jesus after his resurrection, is this now when you're going to establish God's kingdom? So they still didn't quite understand or have the whole picture of what the spiritual kingdom that Christ provided through his life, death, and resurrection looked like. Now, we all know that there'll be a physical consummation of that at the second coming, but the, the, the apostles were still kind of figuring that out. You know, they didn't have the, uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to help them understand the scriptures in the way that's required. And quite frankly, that's what we need too. Paul reminds us, the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that we must have the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures properly or we'll misinterpret them. Must be interpreted only and totally through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So did they fully understand? Well, they probably did in part. They understood that there was going to be a reckoning, a judgment day, because Jesus had said it three times in this chapter. They knew that there was a heaven and a hell and that all souls would live eternally in one of those two places. And God's desire is that all men, all people, would be saved and come to a saving knowledge of Christ. This is God's greatest desire. But as I said before, many people refused it or rejected it. Now in verse 52, as he calls them scribes in a sense, therefore every scribe who has been trained in the kingdom, a scribe was like a professor of the word of God. It was a doctor of the word of God, the doctor of the scriptures. All of these men hadn't gone to any type of formal training in their school. And so all of them were like, wow, we probably have some studying to do that. And that's what really what he's conveying, that, that we are to be students of the scriptures, learners of the scriptures, the Old Testament as well as the New. Because can the Old Testament scriptures lead people to salvation in Christ? Absolutely. The disciple Philip used Isaiah chapter 53 to bring an Ethiopian eunuch to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He led them in salvation through the Old Testament scriptures. And so that's the beauty of the scriptures preserved for us by the Holy Spirit, the holy word of God that is authoritative, that is inerrant, and that is inspired by God, preserved for us as a gift by God. We search the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures, and we find the treasures in the old, and we find the treasures in the new. And it was kind of like that as we went through that memorabilia of our kids. We had old treasures from the past, from their kindergarten years to their, you know, to their teen years and, and all of that. And now we have new treasures, our grandchildren. When I run up and see them and, and uh, Aria for her birthday, I brought her, you know, her present. She's like, Grandpa. And she didn't say it quite that clearly, but I knew what she was saying. And she run to me and she gives me a big hug and I pick her up. And there's nothing more precious than that. But actually there is. What's more precious than that? the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. I know I've shared this before, but I had a pastor and I'm so thankful he told me this. And what he said to me was, Brian, the only thing you can really take with you is your kids to heaven. The only thing you can really take to heaven with you is your kids. And I took that seriously. And every night we would read scriptures to them and we would pray with them. And if we failed to do it one night, they would come and get us. And I love that. We had some guests over one evening and Connie and I were talking about this, and Eli came down and was like, hey, and like right in the middle of our conversation, you didn't read the scriptures yet, Dad. And I'm like, come on, I'll go right now. And I, I just loved those memories that Christ was the most important person in our home. And so the two questions I drill into the confirmation students for three years, two questions that I will continually ask all of you, two questions that I will always ask myself, and if you feel led to answer, please do so. We're in church. We can get excited about Jesus in church. I know that we're South Dakotans, but it's okay to say something in the middle of a service. And so what is the most valuable treasure that you possess? The answer is salvation. Who's the most important person in your life? 
The answer, Jesus. Those two questions will root us in what's true, what's good and lovely. It will anchor us according to God's love and the promise of eternal life that's found in Christ's salvation. It will be our comfort in distress. It'll be our, our compass in the midst of a storm. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. And then that wonderful promise at the end of that beautiful psalm that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. This is the most valuable thing that we possess. The salvation that heals the promise of eternal life. May we never take that for granted. And may we never lose sight of the truth that Christ shares with us in these parables this morning. Lord, I thank you for this text. And again, this great reminder of the great treasure in the midst of of the field, the pearl of great price and the radical love that you have called us to. Lord, help us by your Holy Spirit to cultivate a radical love for you, to foster a genuine and authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, And to always look to him as the author and the finisher of our faith. Allowing the promise of eternal life to give us hope, to give us peace, to give us comfort. No matter what this life throws at us. Be with us. Lead us and guide us according to your will and to your spirit. I pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said.